Hi. Hey, hey, hey. Full room. That's nice to see. And I guess next up, actually, we wouldn't need any introduction here, but it's the only monowheel driver I know, and also frequent flyer on NEOS conference stages since a few years, actually. Uh, a front-end developer, an amazing NEOS developer, a windsurfer, all the things. Welcome on stage, John. Hello. But and before before John starts, before we leave you and you to it, one quick reminder: ask your questions. Use the app. Submit your questions whenever something is unclear. Um, in the best case scenario, everybody walks out of here without any open questions. All right, let's try this. Yes, stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Also, warm welcome from my side. Um, I have to correct something. I'm not a windsurfer, I'm a kite surfer. It's fresher. I kind of fly. So, and as I said here, we are, as developers, we are some kinds of athletes in a young and very upcoming sport. We all try to figure out, to raise the bar higher, make websites load faster, and also try to make them easier to maintain. And if we look at the history of high jump, the same thing happened. Athletes tried all sorts of techniques and uh, figure out which one is the best. And with the time, they all came to this point with a technique called the straddle. It became the best practice of jumping for decades to achieve the best results. And this was looking like that. Let me see if this works. Yes, it works. And some time ago, as you see, they were really nice trousers, really nice pants. <laughs> and it was the technique. And then, on Olympia, one guy, Dick Firstbury, came up with this one. Whoa, it was new. And they say to him over and over again that, we, that he would never be successful. Never ever. They said, it's just gonna don't work. And he just say, well, we will see. Now the reason that I'm telling you this is, is to underline the fact that us, we people, we do not like change. Whenever we spend time and effort learning a certain way, and if someone comes up and challenges that, we feel threatened and get a bit of defensive and say, no, please not. And this thing exactly happens in web development. When someone challenges separation of concerns or challenge the fact that we only should use semantic class names. Semantic class names are named after the content. They're stunning something like a page intro as opposed to how it should look like, the border blue. And the idea is that you stick to semantic class names only, your HTML is free of design concerns and you can completely restyle it just with CSS. And I don't know, some of you may, may know this. It's Zen Garden, many, many years ago in the early 2000s. And all of these websites look dramatically different, but just the CSS was different. So we learned you have to, you need to uh, separate the concerns. And it was the best practice that the uh, that design belonged to the CSS and we should not mix should not mi should not mix presentation concerns in HTML. 
So what about utility classes that we all have seen and probably use one, some of them? These are uh, technically presentational class names. They have design concerns, yes, but at the same time they are pretty handy, pretty easy to use, easy to learn and apply to anything. So in the past no one really complains about that using a few of them. But when someone takes this concept to the extreme and create a scale for font size, font weight, padding, marching, opacity, flex, layout, everything, and then tells you literally to show hundreds of presentational cl concert, uh, class names in your HTML, and tells you utilities, utilities everywhere. The people get hung up with that. It goes against what we have been learning for years now, and it looks some kind of messy too. And yes, it can, can look quite complex like this. And if you see a component like that, you, you act like this, oh, you're not sure what you're thinking about. This is unsemantic, uh, this just kind of inline styles, so much repetition, I hate it. And everyone reacts like this. In first sight, I was reacting like this too. I thought, oh boy, no, please, no, no. Did I mention people don't like change? And there are some guys in the community who have quite some power with their meaning, writing articles like that. It just adds complexity, does nothing. Let's just say, don't repeat the fault from the past times. Uh, it just, just sounds like inline styles with some extra steps. And there were also some tweets from our leading figures in our industry with strong opinions. And this creates a huge divide in the CSS community. And Cristiano, he wrote a very nice article and has a wonderful presentation. It's called Let There Be Peace on CSS. And I suggest we want to check out this, some of them. And what I suggest is that you stop assuming that people are dumb and making mistakes. Maybe we assume that we lack of context to understand why someone came up with a, such an idea. So keep up your mind open and follow me on this journey in, the, in this world of utility. Many years ago in, in Switzerland, I was working in a company and there we use BAM as a method for, for class names. We use Bootstrap, as I think many of you, but mostly we're just using the grid system. And at the beginning of a project, this CSS was just beautiful. But I was joining more and more people, a project, it getting inconsistent. And after some time, the beauty just transformed to a poor, yes, destructive, hard to understand blob of code. The CSS really becomes so hard to update because over the time the project, project change and with every change it was getting harder to update. And over the time it was impossible to delete something as you never knew if this class name is used elsewhere. Instead, what we do we write CSS and write and write and write and write. I don't know if you know this joke. Two CSS properties walk so in a bar 
a bar stool in a completely different bar falls over. How true. And Adam Morris, it's not the Adam from Tailwind, it's another Adam. He uh, wrote an article about CSS and scalability and measure what is the fastest way for a browser to render CSS. And after that, he came up with an idea. It's called, perhaps you heard about it, it's Tachyons. It's also kind of a framework. Later, I will tell more about this. But he has made some strong opinions in this article. Where he said, the best way to maintain CSS is to stop writing it. Ooh. But how do we write maintainable CSS? Or rather, how we stop writing CSS? As we was teach many, many years, we have learned just use semantic class names. And I will show you an example. We have here a small page. I think 90% of the website looks like that. And then someone came up. It's beautiful, everything. Bam, or smacks, or what you want. And they say, yeah, but in one case, we have to put it on top. And yeah, you have remove this top padding. So I would use, use a text with headline, no padding top, but yeah, it's not semantic. So um, I will intru introduce a class who is called, has call to action. But then HTML change further with the next variation. And we have no picture for that. I have removed the top padding. I can't use that because it's not semantic. And uh, I wish I would have a, a class I just can put it on. But I've write a no new one. And so over the time, you get a lot of, lot of classing just doing all the time the same. What if you just use one? And there are some people said, unsemantic class names are breaking the web. And I think there's a big confusion between semantic HTML and semantic class names. And the main question is, can we really decouple HTML and CSS? Like it's told us all the time. And Adam, Waiten, I think, I don't know how to say this name correctly, it's the Tailwind Adam, uh, said that the relationship between HTML and CSS is, is a depend dependency direction. So if you have semantic class names, you can restyle the HTML at will, but the CSS is not reusable and it's vice versa. So if you use presentational class names, uh, it's tied to the CSS and cannot be restyled, but the CSS can be reused at will. And for me, my opinion, these are just two different styles or on how to achieve the same goal, get over the bar. And now I'm working quite some time with Tailwind. And for me, it was really gaining speed and gaining simplicity. It was a, such a huge joy to, to step into this. And it was really nice to, I mean, I'm one of these guys who love CSS and one of these guys who love writing CSS, but in, I enjoy to stop writing CSS and just to concern about how a page looks. And also another thing that was uh, solved with this problem 
is uh, naming CSS. I don't know if you experienced that. It, it's quite hard to, to name this stuff. Oh, no, we already have this. And some other guys, he has the same idea for a different component. And then you merge the stuff, and everything breaks. And why does this happen all the time? Has someone an idea? Why does this happen? That's because your HTML, your current website, is a kind of local scope. And CSS is always in global scope. So before you look at the page, edit the, edit the HTML, edit the CSS, and in some other HTML templates, it just breaks. So that's the default workflow. But with pre uh, presentational class names, you just look at the page, edit it, go back and forth, and nothing breaks. And what you will gain is a ridiculous fast workflow, really. Let me show an example. I know it's a little bit speed up, I think, but just four times. But it's quite handy. You're just writing your stuff. Your IDE support, you get it for PHP Storm, VS Code, all the stuff. It's really nice built in. You can hover the classes and just see what this class explicitly is doing. And if you have a class name with some same property setting, you get an error. It's really nice. And then uh, someone came up and said, yeah, but basically it's the same as just inline styles. Come on. And I say, yes, sure. But what about overstates, pseudo elements, meta query? You can do it with inline styles. You can do specificity and design restriction with inline styles. So it's not the same as inline styles. And it's also faster than inline styles. And one advice if you start using Tailwind or some kind of utility first framework is just to write custom CSS only if you need to. Stop abstracting too early. It's better if your code base looks something like that. You have many utility classes, and some of them are custom. Perhaps they're Smacks, perhaps they're BEM. But you see much faster what's a special case in here instead if you have something like this. And um, in my first tries, I um, use Tailwind as utility last. But it felt like, like the middle of this cat. So after the same issues with the other CSS, it was, it was OK, but it was not that nice. That's why it is called utility first framework, utility, utility class first framework. If you use as a utility last, you can make some kind of important mark uh, setting in, in your in configuration, or you can give a class name. I use this, for example, we have a written uh, integration for Mautic in NIAS. And there we use this with this setting. And then we could use Tailwind CSS in the backend module of NIAS. And it was so a pleasure to do it. And it looks quite nice. You wouldn't rec recognize it as some completely different markup and could I implement some really nice stuff for all the handling of the newsletter system. And I want to tell you a real life story. Some years ago, I created my first Tailwind CSS web page for a friend of mine. He coming also from Switzerland. He's living also in Austria, like me. And this was my first shot. 
my first try with Tailwind. And after one and a half years, we get a quite huge design update with new elements. And I already had some experience with other projects where I use, uh, where I use Tailwind. And for the first time in my career of o over 20 years of creating websites, I could use elements from other projects, just copy and paste it. My, I was blown away. What's the conclusion of all of this? Can it get messy if you use Tailwind? Yes, it will be messy. Do you lose control? No way. You gain control because something of that doesn't happen, any happen anymore. And you will reduce the, the amount of editing CSS. And yes, you will spend more time in your, in your HTML classes, but you spend less time switching files all the time. So what's the deal? And with the concept of nails, with the prototype, you get a kind of Lego blocks where you just can put together. So that's the real separation of concern. You have a component, and everything you need is in this component. And as I tell you before, the guy who wrote the first article, who uh, created Tachyons, he really wanted to figure out what's the best rendering performance for a browser. I mean, inline styles are the worst. Really important because it has to recalculate on every single element all the stuff. Big classes, uh, some classes with many, many properties are also not that nice. And nested classes are the worst. If you're at many level, it gets worse and worse. And it's quite exciting that. Both of them, like Tailwind, was more on the way to it, that it's easy to customize, easy, very good developer experience, and they land on the same result. Let's use utility classes. So now I've spent the most of the time talking about Tailwind, but this talk is also about some other tool. It's called Alpine, and. Perhaps you know React, you, I think for sure you hear about this, or Vue, Angular, Svelte. I prefer Svelte if I need something to do like that. And um, as I read of, hear about this the first time, I really thought, do we really need another JavaScript library? And we can take a look at it, and then you can decide for yourself. And it's not built for, for a single page application. But it's a very declar declarative way to just write your what this JavaScript should do just in your markup. Ah, that's something like Tailwind. Yes, it's like Tailwind, but for JavaScript. Again, you have one file, your Fusion, your AFX, or if you use something different, and you can do everything with that. Of course, if you have larger functionalities, you can outsource it to a separate file. I, will, I do it also. But for the, for the most use cases, you just don't need to. And Alpine Chase is really an ode to simplicity. And I think many of you uh, know jQuery. I think many, most of the websites are really re still running jQuery. And it's kind of a replacement for jQuery, if you want to say it that way, but it's a declarative rendering. 
So you don't write a whole bunch of code for your mobile menu and then again for a pop-up and then again for a modal. You have just say, okay, if someone clicks on that, set this to open and all the magic happens. And the really thing, uh, the one thing I was blown away, I have a teaser in Neos where I said, okay, get, fetch, please fetch me the, the last three block entry of my page. And if I change this in the inspector to six, I don't need to reload the page, I just do need to reload the element. And Alpine says, oh, okay, there's something changed. Okay, I will update it. So you can test this very well also in your browser, in, in the developer tool, setting a variable to true and just update. It just works. And that's really, really nice. And I gained so much speed through that. And for example, if you have a button who should open a modal where you have all this kind of stuff, the button is somewhere deep nested in a grid or something like that, and you have to put the content of the modal is in the body part, I think everybody knows that, then you put the button here in the markup and you have to put the other part at the bottom of the page and have to connect these two perhaps with JavaScript events or something like that, it's kind of complicated. And in the Neos way also, because you have to put your code in on two places. It's not living in one component, right? You know what I mean? But with Tailwind, it's possible just to have a button and with a fantastic tag like template, and then I say X, it's for Alpine, it's all X directive, X uh, teleport this to the body. You have the whole markup for the whole uh, modal in just one button. And this handles everything. It just works. The, th the content of the template tag who is inside the body just gets teleported to the body. But they're still connected and you don't have to care about. You don't have to care about IDs who, who said area labeled by. They're all dynamic. You don't have to say uh, that some node identifier just works out of the box. and. Um, I don't want to tell you more because you can read it by yourself. I wrote a, a very small blog article about this, how you can achieve these kind of things. If you want, you can scan the code or you can go just to my website afterward. And some time ago, I don't know if you, you hear it, but it was quite funny. We have so many questions in Slack like, yes, I installed Neos and I use Neos demo package and I have a question to that and we answer always, yes, don't use Neos demo. It's bad. It's not best practice. And we said we have to change this. So uh, last year we take a lot of time reworking all the stuff. There's still some edgy cases to do, and I will also uh, do some updates on the, on the Tailwind part. And yes, we use Tailwind there and Alpine.js. Go grab the code, ask me some questions, and um, you can see how, someone, how something can be solved. But one thing that is very important for me, also especially in this community, is that let there be peace. I mean, we will see where this both technique will lead us. I think utility classes are the new way to do it. I'm a big fanboy. But we will see. I mean, we are athletes. We try to be better and better and better. And yes, we will come up with new stuff and new things all the time. We will not know where we will be in one year. Perhaps ChatGPT writes everything with that. I tried it a bit. It, quite some good stuff with Tailwind. It works quite well. <laughs> but we will see where we will come to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I think the best way to unite a group of people at a tech conference is talking shit about CSS. <laughs> Even the most rock star front-end devs 
know that the system has flaws. Um, and I also noticed that I think you were somewhat preaching to the choir. I was watching the audience, and with some of the things you said, there was like very enthusiastic <laughs> nodding. And uh, we have a ton of questions. Yeah. Should I start? OK. Uh, so how does Tailwind recognize custom classes? Uh, is there, for example, a background color set uh, in Neo somehow? Or how, how do you implement this kind of um, editor Tailwind it, combination? Um, very good question. We have in the Neos demo example of that. Um, I created, um, also from, from my own side, you can look at the code there. Um, we have custom properties. So you just can create a color value, R the RGB values, and you just get also with that, you will get the alpha uh, feature with Tailwind with that. It's very nice. And you just can write your Tailwind classes text, theme, accent, strong, something like that. And then you will just set uh, the custom properties. And if you change them, the color change. And you, we implement this on the Neos demo distribution, where you just can choose your color, and then the color of the links and all this, time, uh, this stuff updated. And um, I even do, on, on my website, do it a little bit on an extreme array, which just can configure everything I want with the colors, and all the waves, and just custom properties. And I was, I was kind of blown away what's impossible. At the beginning, I was, yeah, I will try this. Oh, it's cool. And at the end, it was, oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's awesome. Because we, I can now just with one page can create totally different pages just in, in case of minutes. And they look totally different just with custom properties. If and you have a question, I can show it to you. We do have. I keep refreshing, and you guys are still <laughs> submitting questions. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad that you didn't go over time a lot, so we have time for them. Um, what I still use in SCSS or other preprocessors is the ability to man manipulate an element in another parent context than originally intended. I cannot do that in Tailwind. How would you work around that? Uh, please repeat it again. I, OK. I, it was too complex. What I still use in SCSS yes. or other preprocessors is the ability to manipulate an element in another parent context than originally intended. I so cannot if, do that in Tailwind. If, How would you work if around there, that? You have nested elements. Is that the right question? Yeah, I think so. Yes, uh, yeah, you can do it because you have some. You can write your own selectors where you can set. Uh, for example, I've written for me, which is just like media content. Uh, double quote and then some some stuff and then every video iframe blah 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 gets gets updated on that you can wrote say it and on that element please all childs react like that or something like that I think the best example for this is a tailwind plugin called, uh, called tailwind typography is really made also for CMS where you just can adjust because you don't want to add classes to every uh, user generated or editor-generated content. So um, yes, it is possible. And yes, you have some ways you have to change how you implement some things and how to write code. But the main benefit is it's getting reusable. I mean, you can use it for customer A and customer B, and that's quite nice. You can spend more time on your motorcycle, for example, <laughs> like me. <laughs> Right. Um, would it make sense to create uh, a Neos package for this uh, so not everyone implements uh, Tailwind stuff for themselves? I mean, if you want to have a build pipeline, I get you covered. Um, that's, that's no problem. Um, I'm, I'm planning to release a uh, NPM package for the Tailwind theme stuff. It needs some documentation. It's, it works quite nice. I use it in many, many projects, almost in every one, because you always have some, some stuff like that. Um, but a, a Neos package, I mean, it's good to have examples, like the Neos demo, where you can look at and say, OK, this could how it works. Um, I wrote a small package. It's for Alpine, for the components to easy reuse. You can also use that for that, uh, but just more plug-in way. So um, 
I think example calls is are for the backend modules. To have kind of components for the backend modules, yes. Why not? We can talk. Yeah. Mm, that would be nice. Already networking. Uh, next question. In my experience, when debugging in the browser, it becomes hard finding the right Fusion component without semantical class names. How do you work around this? I mean, um, you could just use data component, the component name, you're done. Then even you have the correct name if you want to. You can say, I would just want to have this in development mode, for example. So it's no problem uh, to do it that way, but you can also say, uh, I put at the beginning uh, just a class name, and this class name does nothing. I mean, it's no problem. So, And for me, I often just say, OK, this is this string. I just copy the CSS string, search for that. I find it also. So this, for me, was never a, a big loss. And uh, even in, in quite some large project, it was never a huge problem. So, But you could use some attributes, data attributes for that. I feel like so. you're still speaking out of the hearts of the audience, because I see more enthusiastic <laughs> nodding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could just use data. If you want. I mean, if you use uh, the IDE uh, integration from Tailwind, your classes get sorted, and your not Tailwind classes get started at the beginning, so it's just quite easy. I would prefer some data component, name it, uh, if you want to, because it's easier. Um, yes. And I guess that ties in nicely to the last question. Um, how do you implement the uh, purge and file size optimizations of Tailwind? Because Tailwind can optimize the output bundle um, by removing classes that are not used um, with Neos. It's the other way around. Tailwind doesn't remove class name. He just writes the class name he will find. In Tailwind 2, it was removing. And in Tailwind 3, it's just adding those who, who it finds. Um, I mean, again, you can look at the Neos demo as a, there's a small integration, how we wrote this, how to set it up. But basically, it's just very, very simple. You set, you have the Tailwind CSS conver configuration where you set content, and then you can put an array of paths in it, and you say, distribution class, please get me all uh, HTML, Fusion, JS, Vue, uh, Svelte, what do you want files? And you can also do some negative where you say everything but not in this newsletter a package, for example, because a newsletter is working differently, um, has his own Tailwind stack, for example. Um, you can do it like that. And um, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can show you later on, on that. Um, it, the question was how we have uh, managed dynamically added content. Um, in one way, in NEOS, how we write calls, most of them we know what the user is going to be generating, and we ship all of them. And yes, perhaps this one class not used. So what? It's not, not that much code. Um, I have a project. We have a, a webmaster. He generates his components on his own directly on the NEOS website. Uh, there's also a package coming up. It's currently it's private, but it's going to be uh, public. It's a content box. And what we have done there, we just get a signal and just re-render the CSS in, in, in on, the, on the server, and it just works. And if the CSS change, it gets a new hash. And so is the caching solved. Um, Yes, there are, there's, there's many ways you can do that. Um, I can show it to you later on. You can come to me. I think it, this would blow up. It would be our whole own talk if I talk about this content box and how we uh, implemented this in NEOS. But it's possible. And it's fun.
I mean, I, can, I use it also on my uh, website for creating these little demos where I said, oh, press this button and this happens. I use exactly this technique um, to, to have the ability to create some example code. And um, that's really nice. Please remember to let John know about your enthusiasm by rating his talk in the app that everybody has on their phone by now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. I would suggest that, first of all, we give a huge round of applause to John and a big thank you. Thank you.